Hello everyone, welcome to today's episode of the Fountain of Life podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. If you are like me, sometimes you go to the grocery grocery store with a list of things you want to buy. But hardly do you ever come home with everything that is on it. That is, very often there are things that come in your grocery cart that were not part of the list. So how come it's sometimes so difficult to distinguish and to stick to what we want versus the things that we need? Those extra things that came home were things that we think we need and we need to have. But very often, we realize that, ah, uh, no, I got to take it back to the store. I don't need it after all. Or it sits in our pantry for so long, we don't use it, we don't need it. But it came home with us in the first place. So we are constantly faced with the need of identifying what we truly need versus what we want or what we think we need. Grocery may be the lowest level of that challenge that we face between want and need. Sometimes it permeates various other areas of our lives. And there are people who perhaps are spinning their wheels, trying so hard to chase things that they think they need. And eventually it turns out to be things that they want for all sort of reasons, maybe to make them happier or to bring them some fulfillment and all that. Striking the right balance between want and need is important for fulfillment in life because sometimes when we get that balance right, it helps us. But if we get it wrong, what happens variably is that sometimes it can lead to deep financial distress. We never have enough because the things that we want usually outstrips our resources and we may get in debt and the more debt you accumulate the more you become stressed and life becomes very stressful you are always struggling to make ends meet but truly the things that are stressing you out and giving you all the financial headaches do you really need them that is a question we all need to ask. Sometimes those pressures come from societal expectations. We try to be like the Jones. Or sometimes it's coming out of our own priorities. We are all different. And our taste and our priorities are different in life. But ultimately, if we don't get that balance between the needs and the wants, it drives our life into places that we don't want to be. So what can we do about that? How can we get that balance right? And how can we be able to avoid all the consequences of getting that balance wrong, which can be detrimental to our mental health, emotional stability, and all that that we need to have for a satisfied life. Lord, you are a fountain of life, restorer of my soul. I worship you today. Lord, you are the fountain of life, restorer of my soul. I worship you today. Lord, you are. This is your host, Charles Zuta, and I welcome you today to join me to discuss godliness with contentment. Thank you so much. So, why is it important 
for us to be content in life. We have been through a series of other episodes looking at various aspects of contentment. And, you know, like Oscar Wilde defined it, contentment, true contentment is not having everything, but in being satisfied with everything you have. So contentment really is about being satisfied with your present. It is not an ambition killer. Not at all. And it is not leading us into complacency. No. And it's not about giving up our desires and all. But rather, when you are content, what it means is that you are satisfied with your present condition, your present state. And as you see needs come, you see them through a much clearer eye than if you are not content. So contentment helps us to embrace our present and yet make room for our future. So without contentment, there is really no baseline for us. We'll be chasing the rainbow's end and chasing things that we think we really want based on what society is pushing on us and all of that. By the end of the day, even when we get it, there is always the next thing that comes up. And so we are never really satisfied. And that is what people tend to think that contentment is the same as happiness. No, it's not. Happiness is just fleeting. It comes one moment with each thing that we add to our life or something that comes in. Once the gloss and the glory of that thing fades, that happiness also goes away and we try to chase the next thing. So we are more or less like they describe it in a hedonistic treadmill never ends we keep chasing our tail back and forth so what can we do about it one of the things we need to identify is striking the right balance between what we want and then what we truly need if we get that balance right it helps to lay the foundation to a content life and it gives us a clear eye to the things that we truly need in life that is adding up to make our lives more satisfactory and more fulfilling what does the bible say about this now previous episode we saw the letter that paul wrote to Timo, timothy as was encouraging him about being satisfied in life and he cautions the young man about where his value system should be in first timothy 6 11 you know Paul was telling him to chase godliness with contentment and also to flee the things that don't lead to true righteousness, godliness, faith, love, and all of that. So we can be godly people without contentment and that creates the love for money and all the excesses that we are saying. Or we can be godly people and be content and embrace the fullness that God gives to us at his own cadence, with his own purposes. So today we want to go a step further and look at how we can have the tools that we need to strike the right balance between the things that we think we want and the things that we truly need in life, which is going to help us to drive satisfaction in our lives and to strengthen our relationship with God. Now, you need to understand, or we all need to understand, that the world system, as it is, the, the economics of the world and all of those things, they are not set up on godly principles. That is a fact. If it were, we would not have systems such that when you are rather in debt, they consider you to be worthy of more debt. So they give you more money. Because really, debt doesn't help anybody. But the world system thinks that if you have some debt, that means that they can lend you more money. They don't care how you spend that money. They don't care what you do with the money. But they want you to pay it back anyway. So there, there are things that the world system throws at us that we need to approach it in a way that God wants. Money itself... It's not evil. There's nothing wrong with money. It's rather how we relate to money 
that causes the problem. So when Paul was writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 11 downwards, he said, love for money is the root of all evil. So money itself can't do evil or can't do good. It depends on whose hands that money is. So our attitude towards money should be filtered through the plans and purposes of God. Then it can do good. Otherwise, it becomes like a knife in the hands of a two-year-old. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know that that knife could kill people or could even hurt them. So our relationship with money should go through the filters of God's principles. And those are some of the things you want to talk about today. Not just money, but things and our approach to life in general. The Bible says, let's go to the book of Proverbs, book of wisdom in Proverbs chapter 8. It has a very beautiful story to tell. Wisdom is crying out. Wisdom is speaking. Wisdom are the things that we need to be able to navigate this world system. That is like rows with thorns. The world system is like rows. It has thorns. How can we pick the rows and avoid the thorns that come with it? So we need the wisdom of God to be able to navigate what the well system that we are living in is doing to us they said they, they commercialize things they they, they 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 put out the adverts all is correct they don't tell you whether you you it's a want or it's a need they just put it out there and sometimes they try to impress it upon you that you genuinely need this it's going to add this to your life it's going to do this well, the long and short of it is that we have come to see that a lot of the things that the world system is pushing on us actually have thorns. Like when they market cigarettes years back, they made it look that when you, you, you smoke cigarettes, you are handsome, you, 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 you are elegant, you are all of that. It's taking us generations to understand the harmful effect of smoking cigarettes. Same as alcohol. They market it. They tell us all the fun stories about it. But what they don't want to talk about is the abuse, the fights, and the arguments, the poverty, the, the liver cirrhosis, and all the damage that it does. They just give it to you and assume that you will have the wisdom or we will have the wisdom to use those things. You see, so we need wisdom to be able to navigate this world system that we are living in. So wisdom cries out and it tells us something. So Proverbs chapter 8 is seriously marketing wisdom. And as we read it, it tells us everything that we need to have. So verse 1 says, Does not wisdom cry out and understanding lift up her voice? She takes her stand on top of the high hill beside the way where the paths meet. She cries out by the gates at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. To you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O you simple ones, understand prudence. O you fools, be of understanding heart. Listen, for I will speak of excellent things. So, wisdom is crying out. There is no better wisdom than that which God gives us. That is why at the, some of the past episodes of this topic of contentment, I said the foundation to contentment is God. So the only wisdom that surpasses all wisdom that the world gives that we should crave for is the wisdom that comes from God, from the word of God, from what God imparts to us by his spirit. And if you will make time to listen to the wisdom that comes from God, benefits come in our lives and helps us to relate with everything that this world system is throwing at us. So what is wisdom saying? I will focus narrowly on our approach to riches, money, and all. So from verse 17 to 8 in the Proverbs 8, this is what the Bible says. I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. Riches and honor are with me, enduring riches and righteousness. 
So the wisdom of God, if we make that the filter of our lives and not just the clamoring that the world system, the loud clans and the noise of the world system that they are offering us, but rather we pay attention to the wisdom that comes from God by his spirit, through his word to us, it says that riches and honor are with him and jewelry riches and righteousness. So I've likened this world system and everything that is in the technology, the fashion, everything that the world system prides itself in and is pushing at us. I describe it as roses with thorns. They smell good, they look good and everything. But we also need to navigate how we relate to those things because of the thorns that come with them. So with the wisdom of God, we learn how to navigate this world system. So if I'm going to that grocery store and suddenly I have a list, but then as soon as I enter that store, there are 10,001 things that are crying out to me. There should be grace in my heart. There should be some discipline. There should be something inside of me that tells me, you know what? That cake looks really yummy and very nice. Do you really need that now? That thought process comes with the wisdom of God. And it's the same thing with the other things in life that are crying out to us. More of this, more of that. Being able to pause and ask that question, what is the wisdom of God saying, is a key to helping us to navigate the pressures of want versus need. We get a clear eye, but then also we have the tools that we need to make that decision. But the truth here is that if we choose the wisdom of God and the wisdom that comes from God, as Proverbs 8 is saying, it says enduring riches and righteousness. It's not just riches, but riches and righteousness. And that is what Paul was telling Timothy that he should they should pursue righteousness, that's godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, not just godliness, not just contentment, but having contentment with your righteousness or with your godliness is a great gain. So Proverbs says, if we listen to wisdom, the wisdom of God, riches and honor are with him. You see, you can be rich and not have honor. There are many people in our world today who are fabulously rich. How did they get it? You see, or we, we've seen a lot of fabulously wealthy people, but their life is a complete it's disaster. Homes are broken, children are wayward, everything is broken around them. Yet by the world system, they are successful. Why? Because by the criteria of money, they have accumulated enough, more than enough for generations. You see, but what wisdom teaches is riches and honor. God is not opposed to us having riches. He's not opposed to us having things. But he wants us to have those things through his filters. And the wisdom of God is the starting point for that criteria. So the key thing is he wants us to build enduring riches. There are some riches they don't even last one generation because scandals upon scandals upon scandals and everything is dissipated. So God wants us to be rich. He wants us to, to have the riches, but he qualifies his riches by saying it is enduring riches. So it's not like God says that, no, don't, don't make wealth or don't start a business or don't do that. But we need the right foundation. We need the right principles to undergird whatever we are doing so that those riches can be enduring. And also it has the righteousness that comes when we build on the principles of God. You see, when you come to a decision point, under any circumstance, whether on the job, 
you know, whether in our personal lives. And a lot of those conflicting points are the wants and the needs. When you come to those points, that is where you need the wisdom of God. You have to ask God, Lord, what do I do at this point? I don't want to chase mammon. I don't want to spend my lifetime spinning in a hedonistic treadmill and just chasing my tail, chasing rainbow's end. But this is a decision point. What do I do? Trust me, God will give you the tools to be able to do that. He'll give you the grace to be able to navigate that. What else does wisdom do for us? What else do we have to know about the wisdom that comes from God that we need to grab? There is something also in Proverbs 10.22 that we need to understand. Proverbs 22, 10, 22 says, The blessing of the Lord makes one rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. This is the kind of place that we want to be. For God to bless us, to make us rich, and add no sorrow with it. That is what I mean by roses with thorns. God doesn't want roses with thorns in your life. A lot of the times, if we don't play by God's wisdom, we are just craving, chasing, running. And we don't pay attention to what the wisdom of God is saying. We end up with a lot of sorrow. We pick the roses, but we end up with a lot of thorns. We get pricked with a lot of thorns. But when we do it God's way, we do it with the wisdom of God. We can pick that rose with no thorns. So true contentment in life is being patient enough to do it God's way. When Eve in the Garden of Eden didn't want to wait for God's plan to unfold in the life of our first parents in the Garden. And she thought that she could do good, do good to herself and Adam and all without God. We are told what happened. We know that they lost everything that God had intended for them. So they got whatever they thought they needed. She ate that fruit with the assumption that it was going to make her wise. The fruit was good to the taste. And all of those things based on the lies of the devil. You know, as she doubted whatever God meant to do for them. And she went ahead, she disbelieved whatever God wanted to do for them. And disobeyed God's instructions for them. Was their life any better at the end of the day? So, be patient enough. Delay our gratification to get God into the picture. To get God to do it His way. Bring us to that good place where He makes us rich with no sorrows. But the foundation to that is being content. That is why it is important for our future prosper. Contentment is not taken away. It's a plus, actually. Where you tell yourself, Lord, I thank you. I'm happy with my present. But I'm also hungry for more. But I'll be happy to wait on you and do it your way. That is what wisdom teaches us. Being patient. There are some difficult choices, you know, that we make in life, like finding a life partner, maintaining a home, a family, and all of it. It applies to the whole sphere of our lives. Be patient to let wisdom guide those choices and those decisions. Because if we just race out, like we do, you know, with the grocery carts, and just scramble, put things in, it comes with a cost. And that is sometimes the cause of our problems and anxieties and all. Because sometimes the things that we think we need, they come into our lives and they come with tons of sorrows. But God says that he makes us rich and he adds no sorrows. So I would rather wait and have God do it his way. Waiting means being satisfied with my present whilst opening my heart up for more. But more on the basis of what God will do. So if we don't 
get patient and allow God to come into our lives. What happens to us eventually? Just sorrow and pain and misery and frustration. Because sometimes the things that we think we really wanted and we are brave enough to let them go. You know, it tugs at our heart string. We feel the pain and the hurts and you know. But if we look back, maybe time passes and we look back, we realize that, oh gosh, I'm glad I didn't even do this. I didn't get into this. Because then we get the wisdom of hindsight. But how about getting the wisdom of foresight? To preempt getting into that problem in the first place. That is the conversation we need to have with God. Let us look at an example of somebody who had the courage and the wherewithal to not depend on the wisdom of hindsight, but the wisdom of foresight that God gives to us. Let us look at Abraham. Abraham served God. He went through all sort of upheavals. God promised him a son. It took 25 years for that promise to come to pass. And he tried to help God, you know, by making this arrangement with, you know, Sarah made this arrangement with Haggai, they are made, and they got Ishmael, and all the pains that came with it, roses with thorns. But when eventually God's promise came, there was peace around it. It came at a time that realistically, it shouldn't even be happening. But when we are patient with God, even if the circumstance seems so impossible, God owns the circumstance. He owns it. So he will make it happen. So being patient with God is vital to getting that commitment, no, that contentment in life. So what is it that Abraham teaches us that we need to learn? Genesis chapter 14. Abraham's nephew Lord lived in Sodom and for some strange reason, the foreign kings came and captured Sodom and took them away captive with all the riches and everything. So when news got to Abraham, that's Genesis chapter 14, Abraham marshaled his own militia with an alliance of three kings and they chased after this marauding army of kings that had ransacked Sodom and taken Lord captive. And Abraham defeated those, you know, Invaders rescued the people of Sodom that were captive and he got a lot of war booty. Realistically, if you go to war and you have booty, it's yours, isn't it? So let's see the conversation between Abraham and the king of Sodom and the lesson that we can learn from that in as we discuss godliness with contentment. Now, Abraham verse 21. So the king of Sodom told Abraham, you know what? Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. That's a fair deal. Because you can't be a king without people. Even though he couldn't defend them. So, technically, he knew Abraham was supposed to take that war booty. That mar marauding army had accumulated in their raids. But let's hear what Abraham said. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Before Abraham said this, there was a character in that story in Genesis 14 called Melchizedek. He met Abraham right after the war. He gave him bread and wine and he told he blessed him, told Abraham's God is the possessor of heaven and earth. So Abraham got an iota of revelation that even though he's worked with God for all this while, he's come to that place because of Melchizedek's revelation that God is the possessor of everything. So when the king of Sodom offered Abraham the goods, naturally, if Abraham was a greedy person or somebody who was just grabbing and grabbing and grabbing, like how sometimes we all tend to be. He will have confused 
righteousness and godliness and all of that, he will have messed up God's plan for his life. And a lot of times we find ourselves in that place. We think we need something. We must have it. It will add to our life. We totally forget about the thorns that those things come with or even what God is doing for us that moment in our lives. We mess up God's show. So Abraham had clear eyes. He said, look, I will not take anything from you. God has a plan. He has a purpose. He's working something out for me. I will not take even a sandal strap, you know, or a boot lace from you. Because I don't want you to say somewhere down the road, I made Abraham who he is. Wow. That is contentment. Do you think Abraham didn't need extra gold and extra slaves and extra that? He sure does. But he would rather do it God's way. He doesn't want to be known somewhere down the road that oh, Abraham was just a marauding you know, warlord who goes around ransacking cities. That is what wisdom was teaching us. Enduring riches with righteousness. If you want to be like Abraham, you need to have that contentment. That even though this was opportunity for more gold, he would rather not take it. Opportunity for more jewelry and more silver and more all of that, he would rather not take it to protect his reputation, to protect the reputation of God, to protect God's name. Today, the church is in a bad place because People are using all sorts of methods to accumulate more, to get more. If they truly cared about the reputation of God and what it will mean when people see all of that extravagance to the word and the power of God, maybe they will have a different, different approach towards things. God wants us to prosper. He wants us to do well. But He wants godliness contentment where we wait on him he will give us enduring riches but also with righteousness it matters to god how we make our wealth it matters to god how we flourish in life it matters to god he wants us to do it the same way and we should be like abraham where we fight for god's reputation we fight for the name of god and we tell ourselves, I will not take a shoe strap or a shoe string for me, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Why? Because Abraham sees the Lord his God the most high as indeed the possessor of heaven and earth. And it's not beyond him to give him the rose with no thoughts, to give him the riches with no sorrows. But it all begins with we being content and patient with our now. Thank you so much for joining me today. God willing, we will come here with a concluding episode on the steps to contentment. Don't miss that one. And if you haven't subscribed to this podcast, I encourage you to do that in the subscribe button. Share the link with your friends because when you subscribe, you have access to all the previous episodes. And if we have upcoming episodes, you'll get the notifications. So, also, you can download this podcast, play it in your vehicle, in your kitchen, wherever you are, as an audio file. Wherever you get your good podcast, either on Amazon, on Spotify, on Google, and all the places on Apple where you get your good podcast. Thank you so much, and may God bless you. Of my life, I worship you today. The book of Matthew 11, 28-29 Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, 
and ye shall find rest. Amen.